The following interview was conducted with Betty Combs, Bachelor of Science uh, from Purdue University on Wednesday, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, November 12, 2008 at her residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. All right, I was born in West Lafayette. I'm a real Purdue kid. Uh, actually, my father went to the University of Missouri, but he came to Purdue in 1910 on the Ag Staff at Purdue. My mother was born at Rossville, Indiana, and she went to DePaul, but then she came to Purdue on staff in 1916, and she was hired by Mary L. Matthews, and they were good friends their whole her whole life the two of them they they kept contact their whole lives um, my family lived on Russell Street which at that time was the last street in town it was a beautiful street it had a boulevard down through the middle with two rows of trees it had flower beds in the uh, intersections with flowers and uh, we really thought Russell Street was pretty fancy we had all the big wigs from Purdue. We had Dean Potter, and we had uh, Dean Jordan, and we had Dean Reed, and, <laughs> and we had Lulla Gaddis, who was sort of like the head of extension at that time. And then we had Mary L. Matthews on the street right behind us on Waldron, and Waldron and Russell were the two streets with the trees and were really pretty. And then on west of Russell was the uh, what we called the backfield, which was just completely open at that time. There were no dorms or recreation centers or anything out there. Okay. There was nothing between Russell Street and where R.B. Stewart's home was, which is now the president's house. So really, growing up on Russell Street was great fun. <laughs> and we just sort of considered Purdue University our home. I mean, we could do whatever we wanted at Purdue. Were there any, uh, how about your siblings, brothers? And then tell us where you went to school, grade school. Okay, um, I had two older brothers and we all went to school at Morton School, which was the only school in West Lafayette. And it was the built the year that I started kindergarten. So I got to go to kindergarten, and then I got to go all through school at Morton School. Did that include high school? Thank then you. they oh. they were nice. They built a new high school for us the year I graduated. <laughs> Actually. I went to the old high school one year, and then I went three years to the new high school, which is out on Grant. The other high school was down near the village, down on, um, I think it was Fowler Street. It was, anyhow, uh, the new high school was built. I graduated from the new high school out on Grant Street. Okay. Tell us about what high school was like, what activities and things you were involved in. Oh, high school was fun, too. <laughs> and. Uh, West Side was a great place to go to school. I think we had uh, really exceptional teachers and so forth. This may be off the point, but just this last week in the paper, uh, um, Mrs. Kaysen died. She was 106 years old. She was my first grade teacher in Morton School. And she was called Miss Smith at that time, and I just adored Miss Smith. She was the most wonderful person that ever lived. So, um, school was was fun. Uh, I can't. I remember we always had recesses. I go to an aerobics class now at Morton, and they all laugh at me because there's two doors that go out to the playground, which is where we park our cars now. I always have to go in the girls' door. I cannot go in and out the boys' door. When we had recess, we had the girls had half the playground and the boys had half the playground, and never the twain should meet. <laughs> and and I remember doing plays. Um, what about was there a, a year a newspaper or a yearbook at all that the school had? I don't think so in okay. the grade school. Maybe in the eighth grade. It seems to me. Someone was sort of ambitious and put out a little sheet occasionally for the, our eighth grade. But um, 
I don't think we had, now the West Side High School had a nice paper. I mean, a regular printed paper. I have these if you want to see some of them. <laughs> you're, you're an archivist. Well, anyhow. Reservationist. So, uh, I don't remember too much about anything did you walk special. To, did you walk to school? We walked to school. And it was a mile from Russell to Morton. We walked home at noontime, which meant we walked four miles a day to and from so you went school. Home for lunch. We went home for lunch. And uh, we still brag to this day that that's what makes us so healthy because we walked four miles a day. And, of course, we walked across campus, which was great fun. And uh, <laughs> we used to throw snowballs at the students in the winter time, and we used to roller skate and go through uh, the clock tower. You had to go up about four or five steps and go across an open space and go down. You could skate around, but it was much more challenging to go up the steps and skate through the clock tower and back down. And uh, we we used to go in all the buildings. I mean. We go in the chemistry building and where they blow glass and they give us little glass ducks and you fill them with water and blew it on people. And we used to go to the foundry where they made the weights and the anvil weights and things. And I know Dean Potter was a good friend. He just lives up across the street from us almost. And uh, I remember one time my dad and Dean Potter were talking and dad said, why do you let those boys in your engineering buildings? Because the boys used to go in and do all kinds of, st I mean, watch all kinds of things. And Dean Potter, and he talked funny, he'd say, you just wait and see, you wait and see. And my brothers both grew up to be engineers, and my dad was an ag man. <laughs> so, so we, yes, we walked to school, and we enjoyed the campus, and I know the Civil Engineering Building had a, a miniature bridge. Oh, and they had a, a regular engine in an engine house. They had a locomotive. That they were working on, right? And you could, we used to go in the locomotive house and uh, climb all over the locomotive. And they also had a greenhouse on campus. And we used to go in the greenhouse, and especially cold days, you always hit everything, because if it was cold, you hit everything. And we used to go in the greenhouse, and they had a banana tree, and they'd give us bananas. You and really I, had a great. And really, really, being, being near campus and on campus was great fun. Yeah. What was the village like at that time? Was there much activity in the village in those early days when you were in high school and grade school? everything that happened. I mean, the village was the only place that you could buy anything. I mean, they did Is that where you did grocery shopping? You groceries? did do grocery okay. shopping. We had Lux and Humphreys, and we had Piggly Wiggly. We had the bookstores. We had Southworths, and we had Deeks. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a just a general store, Gabler's, and they had scarves and mittens and clothes and whatever people bought, material. It was just a, a general store. Uh, there weren't eating places, not like there are now. Mm -hmm. I remember when the Triple X came, and uh, <laughs> that must have been the late 30s, and my dad won a certificate at a party someplace for $5 for the Triple X. And our family went. And we couldn't eat $5 worth of food. That was because hamburgers were 10 cents. Mother, if we, she wasn't going to fix lunch sometime, which was very rare, but once in a blue moon, we got a quarter. We went to the Triple X, and we could either have two hamburgers and a root beer, or you could have one hamburger and a root beer float and a nickel candy bar. So back to the village. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was bookstores and grocery stores primarily. Sure, right, so that's uh -huh. where you did your grocery shopping and things of that sort. That's where you did all, yeah, there were, there were really no other, oh, there was um, a couple of drug stores. Mm -hmm. Was uh, Arts there? No, it oh, wasn't Arts. Arts. It was it was, there was a Bartlett's, what was the other? Hoffman's, I think. Okay. What about uh, a gas station? Was there a gas station around near there at the all? The gas station was at the foot of the hill. Oh, down the foot state street, down where's the, that uh, Amico, where that station used to be? The, the, it was an Amico at the foot of the hill there. Right, okay. Yeah, right. And um, I don't think there was another 
gas station around that I could. At that time, I mean, I'm going back to where there was no 52. Right. There was no 65, of course, no 52. Uh, it, 26 was the main highway through Lafayette. The road to Rossville at that time, 26, initially I remember as a gravel road. So, you know, it was pretty primitive compared to yeah. what it is now. You had streetcars, right? Street we had streetcars, and they were wonderful. And they went they went down University Street. Right. And they went they, down State Street too, don't they? They went, yeah. They if you started at the north end of University, you could go down University to State, and then at at the end of State and University, you could pick up. There was one coming from State, like out Russell Street. It went out that way, and then it went down through the village and across the river and up the hill on the other side. Yeah, very good. So pretty much like what the little trolley does now, I think. <laughs> I think so, right? But the streetcars were great, and you could ride them for, I think they were a nickel initially. And it was sort of sad when they took them out. We had a last streetcar ride. Oh, there were, there were other branches. There was one that came up Grant Street and came to the end of Grant Street Hill there near where the school is now. And there was one that went up Salisbury. So there were three branches that covered the west side. I'm not sure how many on the east side. I mean, mm -hmm. we hardly ever went much more than downtown sure. or the theaters. Right. right. That's where the movie theater was. There wasn't one in West Lafayette. No. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Okay. No. Uh, trying to think what else was interesting at that time. I remember the last streetcar ride. What was they, that like? Well, they just they just brought the streetcar up to the end of Grad Street, and the school was there by that time. And all the school the kids... The high school, you mean? Yeah. Okay. All the school kids piled on the streetcar, and they took us downtown and back. <laughs> oh, great. That's nice. I remember, you know, they had trolleys. And the great fun on Halloween was to tie a rope across between two trees, and then when the streetcar went by, the, the trolley hit the rope and the <laughs> stopped the streetcar, and then the <laughs> conductor'd have to go out and <coughs> untie the rope and put the streetcar back on. But yeah. what about the tra the end the uh, train that went through campus? You had the train that went through campus, right? Yeah, they okay. had a train that went from from uh, out. Near, I don't know where it was, how far out, but it came right into where the power plant was. Brought the coal and put the coal in the coal pit. Mm -hmm. And I remember the coal pits because that was another entertainment on the way home from school. The tracks you could walk the tracks over the coal pit, and if you were really good, see, you'd walk the tracks over the coal pit. If you were little and scared, then you couldn't do it. <laughs> But but yeah the tra and and it went right by the old home ec building. I mean, there must have been a big coal yard out further out somewhere. Farther out, yeah, because they'd come in mainly coal cars came in sure, on the train. Right. Now they could, I suppose, bring anything that needed sure. to come into campus. Yeah. And then there's a track, and it it must have connected with the track that goes by the airport. There's a main train track out there. Right. That's yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Well, then after high school, what you made your decision to come to Purdue, huh? I went to Purdue mainly because I graduated from high school in '42, and the war had started in '41, and uh, so when I graduated that that spring after the war started. My brothers both went off to the service, and my father wasn't well by that time. And so I, of course, stayed home and went to Purdue, which which was fine. I, I ought to maybe say a little bit about my father. He came to Purdue in 1910 uh, as just an Ag Staff member. And the Ag Staff was small then. I can remember they used to have Ag Staff picnics. And ev all the families would go, and it would still only maybe be 40 or 50 people. But, and, but he came, and he eventually was the um, head of the animal husbandry department, which they call animal science now. 
and he he managed the Purdue Farms, and he taught ag econ. He had some famous students. He had Earl Butts, and he had uh, Parlberg, and um, he had, um, well, what was that other guy's name? <laughs> Anyhow, several of them that, went, that ended up going to Washington, whether that means anything or not, I don't know. But He might have been Laurel Hardy. Lowell Harden, that's who I was trying to think of. He was written up in the Exponent yesterday. He's been here a long time. Purdue. Well, yeah, uh, as I said, Dad came in 1910, so uh, uh, he... How did your father happen to come to Purdue? Was there an offer for a job? Or? I, I'm sure that's it. Uh, okay. He graduated from the University of Missouri in animal husbandry, uh -huh. and he went to the University of Kansas and, and taught there as, or was an assistant or something, and Dean Potter was there at the same time. That's one reason that they were good friends. Sure. And they both ended up on, on Russell same, Street. On the same yeah. street. And anyhow, uh, and Dean Potter used to call him Kettle King. And I, I'd say, well, why do you call Dad Kettle King? And it was Cattle King <laughs> because there were two kings at Kansas and that was the way Dean Potter identified him. One was Cattle King, and the other, I don't, I guess, Engineering King. I don't know right. what he was. <laughs> but anyhow, so then Dad stayed at Purdue then from then on. And, mm -hmm. and, and he, met, he met your mother here, too. And then my mother came in 1916, and um, Mary Matthews hired her. She was one of the two clothing specialists, and then they had two food specialists. I read someplace that there were six on that first staff, but um, the I school was already under the school. The school was, started, I think, in 1910. Right. Okay. And uh, when mother came, I I think I read there were six, but I, I'm not sure. sure. Okay. I don't know what the other two might have been. They might have been management or something like right. that. Or housing equipment and housing, something of that yeah. sort might have been. Right. Okay. So well anyhow, so then she taught until they married and then in those days they were married in nineteen eighteen and he went overseas in the war. I thought this was sort of interesting and I, I you might want to check it out because it may not be quite factual what I say. But as I understand it, they they took all these men that were at Purdue that were of service age and gave them a test and they said okay you're going to be the colonel and you're going to be the major and you're going to be the captain and you're going to be the lieutenant and you're going to be what else anyhow they all got their ranks from this test then they sent them overseas as a unit from Purdue now I don't know if that's factual or not but though, that's right. what I had heard Anyhow, so they married in 1918. Before he left for Before the... he left for overseas. We always laugh because when World War II came along, here we were pretty much the same ages. And we were told we weren't going to get married before they went. <laughs> but anyhow, so, uh, but he came back okay. And uh, while, he, even though she was married, they let her teach while he was overseas. But the minute he came back, they did not allow two people from the same family to be employed at Purdue. And that went on until World War II. You could not have relatives, two of them on staff. How, how, how far back on the relative would, would be just a... Uh, could I don't it be know. a cousin? Or well, someone? I know we had... A, I had a cousin who was working for Purdue on a farm, uh, managing a farm or something, and uh, the farm was given to Purdue. I think it might have been an Eli Lilly farm. And it was given to Purdue, and he had to quit his job because my dad was at Purdue. Uh, so it did extend further beyond an immediate family. So apparently it extended to nieces and nephews because right. he would have been dad's nephew. Sure. right. I think that's right. Here again, you may want to check it I out. Understand, right. You it could, could ask be. someone else about that. Sure. So, what was school like then for you? During well, the war? actually, looking back, I've decided it wasn't as much fun as they have now because we went to school around the. We had three semesters of four months, 
And I know we went to school like on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, the only day we got off the year was Christmas. Now, this is during the war, though, so this the was during the war. accelerated, perhaps, to some See, extent. See, I, I graduated in 42 in the spring, and the war started in December. You high school in 42. Yeah. So, so that when I started to Purdue, the war was on, and uh, we went solid. They had a, 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 a half a semester where you took to get it even because the, the <laughs> it started like in November. The semester started in November? They, it was November, December, January, and February. Then it was March, April, May, and June. Mm -hmm. Then it was July, August, September, October. But they had a special session, not the first year, but the second year of September and October so that you could get in get in rhythm or so I don't know. I actually graduated in three and a half years or less than four years because, and you could drop out. And I dropped out one summer, I mean like one, say July to November, and worked that semester. Sure, right. So, but, but, but they, you could take three full semesters a year once they got rid of that half semester then you took it, um, you took, like, if you normally had classes three times a week, you had classes six times a week. You went, of course, Saturday. And I know I took an accounting course, and there's a tremendous amount of accounting work to do with an accounting course. And I took that, that semester, and I swear I spent four hours a day <laughs> doing accounting every day for that speeded up semester. Sure, right. When did they have commencement then? Were there commencements during the war? Did they have any graduations at all? You know, I don't or remember. I when, don't remember graduating. Okay. I but I did So you had graduated in June. What either. year did you graduate then? I graduated in February of forty six. Okay. Okay. Uh, so did you just get a diploma? Or there wasn't any yeah, ceremony. I, I don't. I didn't have a ceremony. Hmm. I and I don't remember ceremonies particularly. Although they surely had something. Well, there was some sort of a program or some sort, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then what happened? And you majored in dietetics. I made and that, and then I went up to Henry Ford Hospital for a year and took an internship okay. up there. Now the then Mary Matthews was the dean of the school when you were She's there. She's still dean all this time. Uh, I remember going over to her office when I was probably six, seven years old, going with my mother. My mother used to go over and see her, and she used to go down to see her. She lived on Waldron Street behind us, and mother kept contact with her, enough so. <laughs> because she worked for her, right, didn't she? Or she, when she came, she was at the school? Mother was on staff, staff yeah. Staff, that's right, uh -huh. okay. Under uh, Mary, uh, she... Uh, when she first came, she lived on the top floor of that old, they call it woman's hall or something. Ladies' hall? Ladies' hall. Mother right. was telling me this, yeah. yeah. I don't remember this, obviously. Mother lived on the top floor of ladies' hall, and her job was to be the house chaperone for the girl, for the Purdue girls that were living there. They didn't have any other dorm at that time. That was where that the was girls it. lived. Right. And so I can't remember how many she said they had, but anyhow, she supervised them and taught the, all the junior and senior clothing classes, and she got $75 a month for that. So, uh, <laughs> was, did it include, what about room and board? Well, that was room. <laughs> I don't know what board, whether she got any board out of that or not. <laughs> we'll assume that she got something. She was a very close friend of Edith Gamble, who ran the cafeteria. Maybe Edith fit her. I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Probably did. They worked out a deal. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know whether she did that more than one year or not, sure. because, of course... Uh, but she did that while your husband, while her husband, your father was. I guess she, I as I, I don't know how long. If she started in 1916, and I know she taught till 1920, only because that's when you know the war ended, or sure. maybe 1919. Whenever the war ended and he came back, she quit. Then that's when she started having us. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. All right.
Then after the internship, what came next? Well, then I got married. Okay, did you meet your husband here? And he went to Purdue, and he took Aggie Con, and um, then he he did not work for Purdue after that. While he was at Purdue, he used, I think a lot of the students, a lot of the Ag students worked for professors while they were at Purdue. I remember Dad used to have these men that helped as herdsmen and stuff. Uh, you might have heard of uh, the Stewart boys, John Stewart and Gilman Stewart. Um, they were it's Arby's family? Arby's no, not, it's not the just, same one. Oh. Arby didn't have children. Okay. This was just a farm family, actually, oh, from okay. southern Indiana. But I think John was a trustee at Purdue. But anyhow, they were just farm boys that came to Purdue. And, and I remember... They used to come to the house and say, have Thanksgiving dinner with us because they had to stay and take care of the cattle. Somebody had to take care of the cattle, and it was these students. And when Bill was in school, he worked in the ag econ department quite a bit. I I think a lot of the ag students did work for You'd have some uh -huh. I don't think that was unusual at sure. all. Okay. But, he, but once he graduated, then, then actually he worked for a... Um, a farm management company, and and then we went and farmed ourselves. We lived on a farm. Oh, did you? Where uh -huh. about here in town? Out near Rossville. Okay. Uh -huh. What did you did you raise? Did you, we had a dairy, which was a lot of work, <laughs> but it was fun. And of course, that's where I raised my family, and uh, so. You know, I have a lot of good memories of that, too. And it was nice because we were close enough to Purdue. We came into all the football games. My pet, my, well, my father was probably gone by this time. But my, my mother still lived there on Russell Street. So we could come into the football games, and she'd feed us lunch, and she'd babysit the kids, and we'd go to the football games. So that was pretty that was nice. That was a good, pretty good deal. Yeah. That's right. This we could even park in the backyard, and parking's a big deal, too. So <laughs> Even in those days, right? Even in those days, <laughs> yeah. Oh, You had mentioned earlier that you did see Amelia Earhart on your traps back and forth through campus. When we yeah, when we walked from school. Russell to school to Morton, we, uh, I saw her several times. I re, I can still remember I was walking along by the armory one day, and I looked up and I thought, "Well, there's Amelia Earhart." And I think I even spoke to her. I mean, she was all alone. You know, she wasn't with a crowd or anything, and and uh, I wasn't very old, and I was really impressed. And I remember another time seeing her just kind of right down in the heart of of the campus. Sure, right. And, uh, well, we were thrilled to have her there. And, uh, of course, the airport was a big deal when they opened that airport. And another time that was sort of a big deal was Wiley Post was making his flight from the east to the west or the west to the east. I don't know. Anyhow, he had to land at the Purdue Airport and and we all went out to see him. He wasn't happy, but we all went out to see him. So I read accounts of that. Yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, well, that that was pretty exciting. Sure. And uh, really, the airport. A lot of the boys. I remember my brother used to think he wanted to be a pilot, and he'd go out to the airport and sweep out the hangars so that uh, they'd take him up in an airplane. And uh, so the the local kids really had a lot of. I mean, you know, if you wanted to get involved, you could... There's a lot of... Uh, there was a lot could, going on that kids could get right. involved in, yeah. You were mentioning you, uh, Mary Matthews being the dean, but did you visit, did you see Virginia Meredith at all? Was she living in the house at that time? No, no. I yeah. think she... When did she die? I don't think she was a... If she was, she was... Up in the years by the time, yeah. by the time she came and lived with, with Mary. Or Although, just, well, now see, I don't know. Okay. I I don't. Uh, but you, I don't know that I ever went to the house when I was little. I remember when I was older. One time we went there for something, and I do. Re I know she lived till she till nineteen fifty. 
beyond 1956, Mary O. Matthews did, right. because my daughter was born in 1956, and she brought my daughter this adorable little pink dress, which was one of my very, very favorite dresses for her. <laughs> so, and I, I, I know I was pretty impressed because I wouldn't have expected anything from her. Isn't that nice? You know, wasn't that sweet of yeah. her? She was a very gentle. I, I always thought of her as soft. You know, like if you touch a down pillow and your finger think, sinks in, if you touch her, your finger would sink in. <laughs> I, got, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. She, I mean, and I, I mean, she. If you went in her office, she was just very quiet. I mean, it wasn't. It was just she was just a very gentle, soft, very kind, quiet, soft spoken. Yes, yes, right. So you spent your uh, time on the farm then, and did and your husband farmed as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about Georgia. Were you down there at any time? We were oh. when he was still with the um, farm management company after he received they, his degree. Yes. Mm -hmm. They they it was oh maybe five years after the war, and there there was a lot of cheap land in Georgia at that time. And they were down there buying up land and managing farms and things. So and that's what he did. And that's what yeah. he did. Do you yeah. still have the family farm? Did you? Yes. You do? Yes. It's down does, near Rossville. Does someone take care of it for you? My son's on it. He's not he's not farming it this year. First year he's not. But he but is he, it still a dairy? No, no, no. no, no. Um we gave that up when we moved in here. None of neither of the boys ran it as a dairy. Um, after we moved here, we rented the farm for a year or two. Bob is an engineer. <laughs> my, son. my my sons weren't farmers either. <laughs> but any anyhow, uh, so he worked in Indianapolis, and he said, "I want to live on the farm because we'd moved in here." And uh, he uh, we. We said, well, you know, you're working in Indianapolis. How you? He worked for Allison, and your uh, son, yeah. And he said, oh, I'll drive back. And he has driven back and forth now for 25 years, from the farm to Indianapolis. But he said he can drive it in 45 minutes. I mean, he's east and a little south of 26, and he just goes right straight south and hits 65 and. Allison's is northwest, so he says, I can do it all. When I worked for Purdue, I worked for Purdue in extension for 16 you did? years. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, good. And when I drove from the farm to uh, Purdue, it took me almost that long by the time you come through town right. and find a parking place and everything. So uh, Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. Tell us a little about the um, the Mary Matthews Club. Was that uh, going when you were a student, or I don't think so. Okay. Um, we have a little book, <laughs> and uh, so the club started in nineteen fifty two. Yeah. Uh, would you want me to read this? Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, it said the Mary O. Matthews Club was organized in March 1952 by Mrs. J. L. Wayne, president of the Tippecanoe County Federated Women's Clubs, to honor Dean Matthews upon her retirement in 1952. She was an active member of the Indiana Federation of Clubs beginning in 1905 until 1958, the year of her death. So, and it, it's really open to anybody. Tell us what some of the activities at the club uh, and the membership today. Okay, um, the activities are great. I've loved it as a club because uh, it tries to keep up with really what's going on with Purdue. Like you talked about Discovery Park. One day we went out there and they took us on a tour of that. One day we, uh, one meeting we went and we toured the um, new Craner building there. Rawls Hall? Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily just tour buildings, but um, we have a lot of people from Purdue come and be our speakers. What's the size of the membership, and is, who comprises the membership? 
anybody that wants to belong can come. Okay. Now we have uh, Eva Goble, who's a retired dean. We have quite a few extension people. I guess just because one invites another, you know. I was an extension, and I think that's how I got involved. But you don't even have to be associated with Purdue in any way. Anybody that would enjoy coming is are welcome to come. And um, I think the meetings are good. Looks like good programs. I could get the, the programs are good, sure. and they're usually university people. Uh, they don't have to be, or else it's a tour of a new building. Sure. But um, what's about the size of the membership? Would you say? And there's about. I'd, I'll say 18 of us. Good. It's so not I a see. huge club, but it, we still meet in the homes, which... Which you can do with that size group. Which you can still do. Sure. Uh, we have pretty good attendance. I mean, if we have 18 members, we have um, 16 there. I know the the day that dues were due, everybody but one was there and paid their dues. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's a very conscientious group. I mean, uh, everybody seems to enjoy it. And, um, and it continues And the on. purpose is to continue learning and, and keeping up with Purdue. And I suppose mainly home economics things, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. And uh, Let me talk, uh, let's change this out a little bit. Tell us about extension. What were some of your, what did you do in extension at Purdue? Uh, do Did you know you? anything about extension? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. Well, I started in as an extension agent in Carroll County, okay. where you did the general home ec things. I mean, uh, we we had, I think, 22 clubs up there. And uh, so you sort of supervised the clubs. You wrote them a newsletter every week, and, and you went to their club meetings, and you gave them programs. and. And then we also did the 4-H. In the smaller counties, the extension agent did the 4-H. After I was in several years, they started a new program in extension, and they started it because of Lady Bird Johnson. I don't know if you remember, but she had some tenants on her farm that lived in a below-par house or were doing something, and they someone decided that, that poor families needed more help. And they started this extended food nutrition program, expanded food nutrition program, and it was run by extension, and it was working with low-income families the same way that extension was set up for ordinary farm families. When they first set up extension, it was trying to reach the farm families right. and at the local level and bring them up to date whatever the university had learned that was new like if if it was you could home pasteurize your milk you should have pasteurized milk so the extension agents went out and showed them how to pasteurize their milk well this is the same idea only they were wanting to reach poor families and really teach them basic nutrition and a lot of them were getting commodity foods, so they they wanted to teach them how to use the commodity foods sure. wisely. So when they started this program, since I was not that sharp <laughs> at the clothing side of extension, and, and foods, had, I'd taken dietetics, so foods was more my category. So I pretty much switched to that and, and worked in that program. Okay. And I enjoyed that a lot, and we did a lot of things with youth too in the summertime we had uh, I would say like 4-H meetings for low income kids except that they were nearly all foods things I mean and they'd come because they always got something to eat and got a, a meal we often cooked almost a complete meal but it, the idea was to teach them how they could cook for themselves some and <laughs> so forth Right. I enjoyed it a lot. How many years did you do that then? I worked 16 years for extension. Wow. And um, Were you still in the same county? No. Oh. Um, I started in Carroll, and then I went to Clinton. And then when I started the ethnic program, I came to Tippecanoe. And I was what sort of program was that? And that was this food, expanded oh, okay. food. They called it ethnic. Expand, yeah. 
E F N E P. Oh, rather, okay. There was an the acronym for it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Rather than ethnic, <laughs> yeah. the term, the word. Okay. Yeah. No, ethnic. E F. And you were still living in the in Rossville, though. Well, and that was pretty much when I moved here. Okay. After after I started that, I my office was over here on Saginaw. So you and your so husband moved, moved here. It. Yeah. And your husband still kept in charge of the farm? Well, he supervised it, but of course he didn't do any work. Well, that's and okay. Kept yeah. it going. What, 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 then what did you switch from the dairy? What kind of farm did it become? Just crops. Okay. Mainly Corn. because... Corn, soybeans? Yes. Because it takes intensive work to do a dairy, and you can't rent it out to a dairy person. Right. Right. So all we could do, well, actually, when my son moved there, he cropped it himself, and um, with just the crops, he could do it and still do his other job. Sure, right. But um, it isn't that big. I think he, he just cropped about 200 acres. Right. How many it, acres do you have out there? Uh, 266, I think. It's Creek Bottom. It's on the Wildcat Creek. <laughs> Are you a farm person? Well, I know a little bit about it. Later, after we sign out, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm going to suggest? We're running a little bit. What I'd like to suggest, if it's okay with you, we'll do this, continue and pick up some of the other things. We could do a part two. Would that be okay? It's fine with Good. me. Okay. <laughs> Let me this, will, this is the end of part one. Thank you very much.